Hey, I'm Evelyn. And I'm Robert. And we're talking about it. So I have a quick announcement to start out with. So our podcast did not transfer properly to the new way YouTube has it working. And we just found out. Yeah. <laughs> um, by the end of the week, it should be fixed, maybe even sooner. And once that's fixed, all of our past podcasts will be available too. It's all of our episodes will be available. It's just... I basically started the download and it got paused. <laughs> so hopefully by the time this episode comes out, it's ready. But if not, by the end of the week, it'll definitely be ready. It's just, we have a lot, we have almost four years now of episodes <laughs> to upload. <laughs> so, okay. yeah. But yeah, that's the only announcement we have for this episode because... This We're is... doing a double feature. Yeah, so this one is going to be a little shorter than the next one because um, we're being very focused on a single topic right here. Right. So we were originally going to mention this in the, um, or basically the main episode that's coming out this week, but it turned into something more. Um, and so we decided we, gonna, we wanted to discuss it as its own little mini episode. And we think you guys will really enjoy it because... When we get to the topic, we'll let you know, but no matter what your feelings on it are, I think it's something that it is important for us to talk about, even if it's very controversial, we'll say. Right. <laughs> so to get into it, we're basically talking about the relationship of Legolas and Gimli. Yes. So it's one of literature's greatest friendships. However, they're bros, are, man. They're bros. They're bros. They're absolute bros. But there are modern interpretations of them as being queer coded and in a romantic relationship. And so we're going to talk about that as well as the discussion of inter of modern interpretations of characters as a whole, um, with a focus on Legolas and Gimli, because while there are other interpretations and arguments for other friendships being considered um romantic in lord of the rings this one is the one that is talked about the most it is one that is used in the wider discussion the most and the one that no matter what my feelings are on it has the most evidence for both arguments which is why we wanted to use that so you automatically hear the thing like Legolas and Gimli were in a romantic relationship and you think it's crazy fangirls it's fan fiction and yes there's that but we're not going to talk about that this is something that is a serious literary discussion with modern interpretations so basically there's in literature there's a discussion right now about overall reinterpretations of characters based on personal experience and perceptions. So this is happening in literary studies of both classics and modern literature. Um, it happens in all media, but we're going to focus on just Legolas and Gimli, Tolkien, and literature at the moment. Right, and I, and I want to say something now, too. So literature is meant to enhance your intelligence, to enhance your meaning of what the world is around you and you can't take literature that way if you're looking for coding you know modern coding uh in those books yeah that's something i'm going to touch on a little bit yeah. later too yeah. yeah there's it's it basically boils down to two main arguments of should we even interpret characters that possibly differently than the author intended and if so does it change the meaning of what the authors intended so i'm gonna kind of try to keep this as linear to my notes as possible that way we can touch on everything so we don't do any crazy rabbit holes okay. well, um, I wanna, and i want to mention one more thing mm -hmm. as we get started so you know a lot of people see Legolas and Gimli going off into the world to explore. Mm -hmm. And they think, a lot of people just think that they're out there by themselves. Mm -hmm. And the reason they're doing that is because, you know, they're lovers. Mm -hmm. uh, but what people don't realize is that what Legolas and Gimli spent the most of their time helping doing 
was they were working with the elves and the dwarves to rebuild Minas Tirith. Around Middle Earth as a whole, but yes, we'll get to that a little bit later right, in yeah. my notes as well. <laughs> Believe me, we did actually discuss this. We just we have a lot of thoughts and feelings for both sides. So we just we want to make sure we get all of our thoughts and all the information out there because at the end of the day we don't want to tell you guys what to think we want you guys to also make your own opinions based on all of the information we can give you so as a little introduction um for those of you that might have missed it um i am a queer woman i identify as queer specifically as pansexual but personally i prefer to use the term queer to describe my sexual orientation and I am part of a underrepresented community of the LGBTQ plus community as a whole, but also that even smaller umbrella of bisexuality and pansexuality through that. And because of that, I completely understand and sometimes even share the desire for more characters like myself and to see myself represented in media. I am personally not a very creative person, so I'm not going to go and create my own characters, but for the people that do, I absolutely love it. However, a lot of people who are in marginalized and underrepresented communities, um, they tend to look and interpret characters that are in both modern and classic literature, which I think Lord of the Rings kind of straddles both of, that way they can find themselves in a rich and very important piece of literary work. I would argue that Tolkien is a huge influence on fantasy genre as a whole. It is a huge fandom. It's a big deal. And people want to try to find where they can fit in that. And so it's sparked this overall debate of whether or not we should interpret characters based on our own backgrounds and feelings and perceptions at all. And the arguments for it say that there is nothing wrong with using your own worldview and experience to interpret a character's words and actions and how it relates to yourself and what you know. Um, what someone says or does a hundred years ago may mean something completely different than what it means now. And I'm going to give the Legless and Gimli an example after I present both arguments. But for now, um, Gilbert Hyatt talks about that in his article, The Reinterpretation of Myths, which is something that is an ongoing discussion in, for millennials at least, is to look at different myths and reinterpreting them in a modern lens as they were written. But I, you know, I don't have a problem with that because, I mean, that's basically what Tolkien did. Mm -hmm. You know, he used a lot of Middle Earth, uh, Middle Earth, <laughs> he thought uh, a lot of old, uh, Middle English and Old English uh, to myths inspire. and stories to, you know, took those as an inspiration. Well, um, the, also, I, like, for yeah. also, for example, um, his idea of elves closely matches the Icelandic idea of elf. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then there's some things about the dwarfs that he took out, um, from different legends and myths and stories. Right. And how he viewed those legends and stories and how that influenced his own writing. Right, yes. And uh, a great example of this, so I'm going to put a spoiler warning right here, skip 30 seconds ahead um, for Percy Jackson television show. Okay, so a great example of the reinterpretation of myths is uh, the Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief, the Disney Plus show, which shout out Percy Jackson, amazing, love it, and the show's been really good. They changed the entire Medusa story arc based on the current popular 
reinterpretation of the Medusa myth itself, where instead of seeing her as part of the offending party, she is she was actually a victim of circumstances. However, the show, while they reinterpreted the story based on that current interpretation and argument of the myth, the story itself is not changed. The themes of what this character represents does not change and how it affects the story, the plot, and the other characters and their own morals and ideas does not change. And that is, in my opinion, a good way of doing that, where it, where it, it enhances the story or changes the story itself but the meaning behind it does stay the same and the opponents of if we should be reinterpreting characters or even myths based on what was culturally meant at the time such as with Tolkien that we should not be turning characters into something else that any type of change to the characters changes the story and changes the intended meaning by the author. And they think that the written works should just stay the way they are, be interpreted as the author intended. And if we want to have our own feelings about that, that can be fine, but we should not read more into it than is there. And there can be arguments for that as well, where if we fundamentally try to change who a character is because we want them to fit what we want to be in the story, then it may change the entire plot entirely. And so I'm going to give the Legolas and Gimli relationship um, example because like I said before Legolas and Gimli are a huge part of this discussion so from the text as well as intentions of Tolkien the friendship between Legolas and Gimli is an important and imperative part of narrative uh, friendship itself is a major theme and we especially see that in the evolution of their friendship because at the beginning they come from two different cultures with multiple with multi-generational hate for each other and then they become as close as brothers essentially and we see the slow progress of them first learning to even trust each other um and then they become trusted battle companions where they can know that they can trust the others in a fight. And then they become respectful of each other and become so close that they start to defend themselves from mistrusting strangers. And then they become affectionate and attentive to each other's needs and desires where at the end of the events of the Lord of the Rings, they both go out and they explore for the sake of exploring. However, they also work together to both rebuild dwarven society and elven society to help man as a whole as well. And they both help to that. And then after all of their friends had passed, they get on a boat and head off for to be together for what is essentially eternity and Tolkien wrote this very meaningfully that it's not just two people becoming a close friendship and brotherhood of these different cultures it is something that was relevant then and is relevant now where we still have groups of people that have multi-generational hatred for each other mm. not going to get into it because it's, again it's a totally different conversation but it really can speak to the fact that these friendships they they don't just help 
like the friendship and the perception of other people but the forming and the results of that friendship changed the entire world for good however since tolkien wrote this western masculinity has changed or the idea of western masculinity has changed and again whether that's good or bad different conversation however it is different and the journalist margaret lockyer um wrote about how many of the ways that tolkien writes a strong and respectful and affectionate friendship the same writing is used in modern literature of queer coding like those same things and so it can be easy for someone who reads these this modern literature where it is intended to be queer coded and then they see the same writing from Tolkien and they think that either it was intentional or the interpretation of it is just a great way to have that place where those of us who are in the LGBTQ plus community can find ourselves within that story. The other argument is that um, by turning their platonic love into a romantic one completely hinders the point Tolkien was using their friendship to make. Uh, he, while some authors typically leave things vague and up to interpretation, Tolkien very famously has an opinion about every little thing and has, and as we've talked about lots of times in this podcast, if you write him a letter, he will clarify exactly what he was trying to do. And he, he has a point for every little detail. And that is what he was trying to do about that multi-generational friendship that we were talking about. And if there, the argument has been made, if their relationship was romantic, would that in turn cheapen the point that Tolkien was trying to make about that friendship? Because obviously that's something that we all need to decide for ourselves, but the argument is that a friendship being turned into a romance, it sends the message that only attraction and romance can make a difference for what this is trying to do, or that the ultimate end of all these relationships will always be romantic. And if the romance is the part that is focused on even as just an interpretation that it's like oh it can be interpreted of it and we just focus on the romance element that it takes away focus from the statement the author is trying to make so also what i what i see in this is that every time in almost any other place movies tv books cartoons when you see two cultures coming together, it's always because a romantic. That is something that is very prevalent in modern media, including literature, where a lot of times we have, it's the, it's the common trope, enemies to lovers is very popular. And we do see a lot that, well, and that's a, just, but in, in this part of the argument itself, like romance sells. And so. Well, it's not, I mean, but it's not just modern. You know, look at some of the old, old tales of a king marrying off their daughter to this other king. So, you know, to, so, so the truce will happen mm -hmm. or, you have, you know, the girl, um, the young lady falling in love with somebody she sees from afar. And when she finds out that that's, oh, that's the son oh, the of The Romeo evil. and Juliet part, yeah. yeah. So it's not just modern thought. It's ingrained in Western culture. It is. That any time two cultures come together. Or two different and or two people from different cultures come together well, one, yeah. that uh, they'll ultimately fall in love. Right. And or they have fallen in love and that's why they're coming together. Right. And that's how they change society. And I would argue there's nothing wrong with that. However, in my opinion, we need 
all those different sides. Right, but, like friendship yeah. is just as important as romantic relationships. Right. And that is something that like we talk about as millennials where it's like girls and guys can't be friends. It's like uh, they can. They have like you have great female male like friendships that never become romantic and can do really good forces for good. And then you also have now within the LGBTQ plus community, you see people that's just like two male characters being friends. Oh, they have to be together or two female characters being friendly. They have to be together. And again, as part of that community, I understand the wanting of certain characters to be together because of it making sense. Doing it just for the sake of always doing it the question becomes, does it change the overall themes and point of the story? Because yes, characters are incredibly important and character relationships are incredibly important, but that's not all a story is. Correct. Yeah. Um, so, so some authors, like we were talking about, they do intentionally leave things vague and up to the interpretation of the readers, while other authors have said that while this was not their intention of a interpretation of a character, that the interpretations that readers may have is completely valid. And this takes us to the uh, part about... Hermione Granger again, along with Annabeth Chase, which is a non-spoiler uh, <laughs> uh, thing about the Percy Jackson TV show. So both authors have publicly stated that the interpretations of readers of them as women of color is completely valid and they support them because especially for Hermione Granger within the book, a lot of the experiences that she has is extremely similar to experiences that women of color have and there's this amazing book you have the title because i keep forgetting the title okay so it's called the dark fantastic race and imagination from harry potter to the hunger games and it's written by ebony Elizabeth Thomas. Yes, and she definitely read it, guys. It's a great read. And she specifically talks about seeing herself in Hermione Granger. And then again, with Annabeth Chase being cast as an incredible actress who is a woman of color, the authors have said of both characters that interpreting them as such does nothing to hinder the characters it only adds to have readers have more of a connection to the story and the characters themselves and you see that translated where in the cursed child the first hermione that was cast on the stage was a woman of color and the changes can help people from those underrepresented communities again, connect with those stories more and feel more seen. Um, the last example I'm going to give is from comic books, where the interpretation of the character Tim Drake, who is one of the many Robins of Batman and Robin, for almost decades now has been interpreted by fans as being bisexual. And the writers of his current comics apparently thought that not only did it not hinder his character, but it actually added to his character and his personality and was such a great interpretation that they made it canon in the comic books because a major part of this particular character is while he is very confident as a superhero, uh, he is extremely socially awkward as a teenager and is still trying to find out who he is outside of being a superhero. So that's where we have that. So we see Legolas and Gimli, and you can have those people see their own experiences with understanding their sexuality represented there. But again, the argument remains, does it take away from the story um, if you're just focusing on that part or that part in general? But individual interpretations of characters um, that you reflect 
yourself into is not new. Uh, my favorite random knowledge factoid of all time is that Alexander the Great actually wrote um, some letters and stories comparing the relationship of Achilles and his best friend Petrocles to Alexander and his best friend. Now, as a modern society, we will also interpret that differently about whether or not that is a platonic or romantic relationship, but it just shows that it's nothing new to find yourself in stories and use stories to help represent who you are and figure that out. So that's kind of where we land. Uh, I'm definitely nowhere near a literary scholar. I just find the literary scholarly discussions of this very interesting and the fact that Legolas and Gimli are a huge part of that. And you see it a lot. A lot of people really enjoy that interpretation. We thought that it was important to make this episode, well, mostly me talking since I do all the research for it, but we thought that it was an important thing to talk about and we want you guys to form your own opinions again from just all the information and um non-stop uh verbalization from me about it yeah. so i yeah so i want to, you know to put my little two cents in here too mm -hmm. uh, so i also feel like it's part of it part of putting labels for better or for worse on characters in a book it's kind of part of what i see as a problem in modern western world of need to put a label on everything uh, we're too quick to do so um a you know someone who someone who is called a karen Mm -hmm. Okay, and then there are certain minor things somebody might do, and then they're thought of as a Karen, mm -hmm. even though it was very minor and they've never done it before in their life. Mm -hmm. um, another one is uh, teenagers of color are troublemakers. Mm -hmm. That's and that's been around for a long time. Oh yeah, but it's still here. It's still mm -hmm. ingrained. Because that's something that I think, at least in the Western world, is especially ingrained in my generation of the need to label yourself. Because it comes from, I think you and mom have actually mentioned it, like Gen X started doing this too, where you you want this label because you want to find where you fit and what type of a community you can have through that label. Think about the breakfast club. Like, it's like, I'm the geek, the the loser, the whatever. Right. And, well, uh, yeah, and, and, and the whole point of that is it's like, we're more than just the labels. Right. And that's a conversation that has been going around forever yeah. in at least Western society. Right. And then, you know, for Xers, it, Part of it comes out of us being latchkey kids. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we walked home from school by ourselves, or you know, with a group of friends. No, no adult supervision. Mm -hmm. Got home, no adult supervision. We had rules. You know, don't get on the phone, lock the door, so forth like that. But so we wanted to connect with something. Mm -hmm. And that's why a lot of Xers joined groups. Mm -hmm. And I also think that's why a lot of those groups are hurting now for members because their identity have, is so ingrained and so specific. Right. And they and they haven't gone to the next phase. Mm -hmm. Uh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's um, something we see in groups that we volunteer with. Yeah. And then also, you know, and one more, I want to call it a stereotype. It's not a stereotype. More, it's more, more of a label. You know, when when you see somebody wearing a red hat, like mm -hmm. a red baseball hat. This is American for our international listeners, but you might get this. Somebody wearing a red baseball hat. It's assumed that they are an ultra conservative evangelical um, white Christian. Yes. And, and people who don't like that, to, and I am definitely guilty of it, I will admit, will make strong judgments of them without even getting to know them. Right. 
And then I'm going to go one step further, and we'll see if Evelyn <laughs> edits this out. <laughs> I think I'm the one that told you this, but continue. Oh, it's keep it's men having to put testicles on their trucks. So, and, he wouldn't and, allow it as a and, part of a clean as as part of the clean podcast. I'm going to technically allow it as it is a scientific term. I, I can see that's what you mean. Yeah, yeah it's like because we try to keep this clean for the kids. So you know what we mean on the trucks, the stuff hanging down. Right, and so you know the joke is you know that they're you know compensating for something. They're compensating is the for way something. we will say that. And now that they have testicles on it, it's even more so of somebody you know overcompensating. Right. On the flip side mm -hmm. of this. And again, Evelyn might delete this. <laughs> uh, you know, I don't delete much. I so, keep in our goofs. <laughs> so you're starting to see the testicles go away. Mm -hmm. Because someone, and I wish I knew her name. Uh, it was um, it was an editorial by somebody, recent, uh, not recently. But, I think I know where you're going. Saying, We're going to use the word female parts. Continue. Wrong. Oh, okay. Where are uh, you going with this? So, the some somebody wrote an editorial about this phenomenon, mm. and said said I don't know, you know, that they are trans trucks. Oh, that's hilarious! Because they added testicles to it; it was born without them. Mm. And it was it, it was probably a combination of that. As well as the stereotype that it became. It was probably a combination of both, honestly. Yeah. But what I had mentioned before when we were talking about popular stereotypes is that those people with the red baseball caps that may be um, conservative evangelical Republicans in America, they see especially young people with um brightly colored unnatural colored hairs especially blue is the big common one that they like to make fun of and stereotype of they assume that the young person is a extreme liberal that with all of the stereotypes that they believe about that which again like as a, as someone who constantly dyes their hair neon colors <laughs> i can understand that there is a label attached to that but the, that the other, is unfortunate again, because it stops those two people that immediately think they're going to hate each other from well, trying to have and, conversations. And, and, you know, and, and again, um, when we talk, you know, we're, Evelyn was talking about young people dyeing their hair. Well, we see older people doing it now, too. I know. I, I have a I have a pastor friend of mine who's only 10 years younger than me. He's always dyeing his hair and his beard. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, at first, he was dyeing them with the liturgical colors, but now he's just going out there. That's honestly hilarious, and I love that. Um, so, <laughs> almost, awesome. so almost every church I've been involved with, a group of older ladies went, um, during February have a kink strip of hair that's been dyed mm -hmm. you know or wearing an extender mm -hmm. um that's pink though i mean using that bright color in their natural hair some of them go all the way and <laughs> dye all their hair pink but you know it's their you know it's their way of Show, expressing themselves expressing themselves which is no different from young people wanting to color their hair mm -hmm. they're just trying to find a way to express themselves yeah and i think I, it's all awesome i just like really bright colors and it makes me happy and i just that's that's the end to mine <laughs> all right so but, so now that this 10 minute episode has run on to five and a half hours so right so to wrap it all <laughs> so again to wrap it all up well for starters I love that things like this 
can have these types of conversations. And we've had these type of conversations on the podcast before. You can find bonus episodes where we talk about things such as um, dwarves and Judaism and how they connect, um, where we actually interviewed um, oh, um, some really cool people about that and some other things. So definitely look at that. But the overall takeaway that I have is this issue itself is just not black and white, that there are a lot of different, I, dad just made a face and I realized what I just said, did not mean it that way. Ha ha ha. Um, but anyway, it's not right or, there's no like right or wrong answer that applies to every single thing like a label um but that different interpretations and their impact on the story and the author's intention should be taken into consideration but also allowing underrepresented people to try and find where they fit in to these literary works especially such iconic stories so whether or not Legolas and Gimli's um, relationship had anything romantic in nature or whether or not this wider discussion should even be having it at all we're gonna leave that up to you guys and that's all I had so I've been Robert and I've been Evelyn and this is kind of like been talking about it <laughs>